Hello, I'm Jim Richards, and today we're continuing what I think is an incredible series about New Covenant prayer, how to pray and get results, how to pray and make it work, how to pray and move mountains. And I'm telling you something, you don't want to throw your life away. You know, it's an interesting thing that Jesus said in one of the parables of the kingdom. And all of Jesus' parables of the kingdom were parables that were teaching us about how to live in this realm, this New Covenant realm called the kingdom of God. And, and he, get, he put forth a parable said, men ought to pray and not faint. I want to tell you something. You don't want to get to the place to where you're discouraged with prayer, where you're giving up on prayer, you're giving up on God, you're giving up on yourself. You want to be at a place where you always know God's going to hear you. You always know God's going to answer and you always know his promise is going to prevail in your own heart. <clears throat> you know, if you want to share this with your friends, pop them out. And if you want to use this in your, in your I group, in your home study, in your church group, go to www.impactministries.com. We keep all of these all the time just for you. I'll be right back. Hello, I'm Jim Richards. I want you to know that I've got a great free message that you can download this month. It's called Prayers That Always Get Answered. When you pray your prayers, you want to know that they're going to be answered. This is going to help you tremendously. You know, the Word of God is still the same. All of God's Word is true, but the conditions, the stipulations are all different. All the stipulations for all new covenant promises is whether or not we are in Christ and whether or not our faith is in Christ. In other words, the one thing that qualifies me to get every prayer answered is what Jesus accomplished, what he received through his faith, the inheritance that he obtained at the resurrection, and the fact that I am in him and share with that's it. That's the, you know, it's no one problem is bigger than another. You know, it's an amazing thing. We think that we think that you know cancer is a bigger problem than the common cold. Well, well it is on the natural plane, but it is not as far as what God God's Word says and what God's Word promises. We make problems big or small based on the way that we view them. And so we want to bring everything back to the cross of Christ, back to what He accomplished His death, burial, and resurrection, what He obtained through His inheritance, and the fact that we are in Him. Man alive, that should make life so easy. You know, there's a couple of I'm not, I, I, I'm not saying this is all there is, but there's two new covenant laws, as I call them, that uh, are principles that you really have to grasp if you're going to be effective in prayer. And listen, I want you to, I want you to be able to pray and know you're always going to have an answer. I want you to be able to pray and know you're always going to get the, the desired results based on God's Word. And so here, here are the two laws of New Covenant prayer that I think are top priority. Number one, Whatever you're praying for and, and however you're praying must be absolutely congruent with the finished work of Jesus. In other words, I can't jump past the cross of Christ and go back to the Old Testament and start trying to live up to the Old Testament stipulations and rules and regulations. Remember, we, we, we are qualified for all the promises. We are delivered from all of the curses because we are in Jesus. Now, if our mindset is not rooted and if our faith is not rooted in the fact that we are in Jesus, then you're going to be all over the map trying to figure out why you're qualified, why God should bless you, why God should answer your prayer. That's always going to lead you into a place of dead works, religion, and and uh, ceremony. Uh, man, you, listen, you want to be where, when you're, when you're talking with God, when you're communing with God, you want to be where it's like having a relationship or a, a conversation with, with the wisest person you know who loves you, who wants to help you face life and, and win at every challenge that you're going to face. And that's, that's the way I approach God, and that's the way I talk to God. Now, and, and, and the fact that God is so loving and God is so proactive that he gave us everything that pertains to life and godliness through the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't wait until we came and said, I'm going to give it to you now. He said, it's yours. It's right here for you in Jesus. Step into this. That's the reason the Apostle Paul said in the book of Corinthians, he said, God has given us this ministry of reconciliation. He says, so man, we plead with you, be reconciled. Enter into this reconciliation where you put off that which is all connected to the curse, that which is all connected to the world, that which is all connected to the old man, and you put on all which is connected to the Lord Jesus Christ, to his inheritance, to his promise, to his righteousness, to his identity. 
Now, the second law, or I'm not saying these are the only important laws of a New Testament or New Covenant prayer, but these are just two very, very important. And this is the law of binding and loosing. And the law of binding and loosing. See, there's so many things in the New Covenant that we're asking God to do that God has, in fact, already told us to do. You know, uh, we're praying and asking God to solve problems in our life when the truth is God doesn't need to do anything to solve those problems in our lives. We need to believe the truth about who we are in Jesus, what we have in Jesus, what we can do in Jesus. We need to put that on in such a way that's, that's how we see, feel, and sense ourselves, and that's the, the strength and the power out of which we live and, and out of which we face life. But instead, people will beg and beg and beg God to change something in your life. Let me tell you something. You want something in your life, you've got to make a decision. You've got to decide you want your life to be different. You've got to, and not just different, you've got to decide what you want your life to be. I tell you, I have an incredibly powerful series called uh, The Supernatural Power of Making Decisions. And I'll tell you, the way God created us is if we fail to make a decision, we just default to whatever our feelings and emotions and ideas are. I'm going to tell you something. When we're willing to make decisions based on the Word of God, everything in us and everything around us starts changing just by the power of making a decision. We were creating the likeness and the image of God. So binding and loosing is much like making a decision. Now let, me, let me just make sure you understand binding and loosing. Almost every time a, a, a charismatic or a Pentecostal or a word of faith person talks about binding and loosing, they're talking about binding and loosing the devil. And there's really, Jesus didn't tell us to do that. Uh, he did tell us to bind and loose. And what we bind and loose is that which is happening in our life and in our world. And when we, and when we bind something, we are, we are declaring it unlawful. This goes back to the put off, put on. We are declaring it unlawful. We are choosing not to have in our life. When we lose something, we are declaring it lawful and we choose to allow it in our life. So, but the question is, how do we know what, you know, what we should uh, abide what we should lose. So it's real simple because in the Greek, it, it's very clear that it's talking about that which has been bound or declared illegal in heaven. In other words, through the finished work of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, if it's been declared illegal, it has no right in your life. You don't have to put it with it. And if, if Jesus obtained it through his death, burial, and resurrection, then it becomes a promise that's yours and, uh, and, and, and you, you shouldn't allow yourself to be denied because it is yours. So this really changes everything because remember, in the Old Testament, people prayed to try to believe and, and they were operated at faith to believe for what God would do in the future. We are praying and operating faith based on what God has already done in the past. And so, man, I want to tell you something. Uh, th this changes everything. So, always pray based on the finished work, which means it's always going to be positive. You're always going to be focused on the solutions. You're not going to be, you're not going to be focused on the problems. It's always going to be present tense because, because God is a right now God. You know, uh, the, the disciples had a problem with this. Of course, the Jews really had a problem with this. As an eternal God, God exists outside of the realm of time and space. And there is no yesterday with God. There is no tomorrow with God. There's only right now, which means until we bring the results into this very moment that we are in now and we grasp them as being ours right in this very moment, then the real truth is we're not, we're not operating with the God kind of faith. And last of all, we always want our, uh, we always want our prayers and our binding and our lips and all this to be personal. This, this is about me. This is not about anybody else. This is not what uh, somebody else needs to do. This is not what somebody else needs to see. This is just about me and just about my issues. You know, the world has always been confused about prayer. And that's why uh, the disciples wanted to know how Jesus prayed. They wanted, they, they wanted to know what it looked like when he prayed, what it sounded like when he prayed. Now listen, there is a scripture, and I understand how people get off on this. I don't want to just bash anybody, but there is an idea that Jesus was a teacher of the law and that Je therefore Jesus operated under the old covenant and, uh, and he, therefore we can't really follow his teaching or follow his lifestyle. 
I, you know, I understand what people are saying when they say that. I understand the confusion. I don't doubt that somewhere early in my life I even said something close to that. But the real truth is Jesus is not a teacher of the law. He is a teacher of the kingdom of God. And he came to show us what God's word would have looked like if it had been put into practice from God's original intentions. And listen, if you want to, if you want to dive into more of this, get, get my study on the book of John. Or if you, if you really want to sort it all out, get my, my book, Apocalypse. Because I'm telling you, I, I go through this step by step by step by step and help you understand about Jesus being the light of the world and bringing revelation about who God was. So, so the world had been confused about everything about God because the people that were trying to explain things to God's followers were people that had never seen God face to face. They really, they, were, they didn't have the Holy Spirit in them. They weren't born again. They were just taking a stab at trying to intellectually understand the Word of God and, and, and telling people, interpreting it for people, telling them how they should put it into practice, giving them their interpretation of the Word of God. And so Jesus comes on the scene and uh, you, you know, and I don't have time to go in this, but I'm telling you, Jesus always sorted out the difference between the civil law and the personal laws. And it's an amazing difference. Listen, I'll be right back. Don't go away. We've got to take the next great step about learning how to pray with Jesus. My new series this month, New Covenant Prayer, The Secret of Powerful, Effective Prayer, is going to be a deal changer for you. It's 12 incredible messages. And now listen, I teach this series or reteach this series every few years because prayer is so effective and we've got to have a powerful prayer life. And this month only, I'm going to have a special offer for you. This would normally cost you $84. This month you can get it for $59 uh, in CD or you can download it for less than that on MP3. All right, so we have this wonderful account in the book of Luke, the 11th chapter, and we also have it in, in Matthew where Jesus comes on the scene and, and, and he's, uh, he's praying. And, uh, you know, obviously Jesus would go off alone and pray. And I find this kind of interesting because he, he, he didn't force them to go pray with him. He would go pray and it seems like those who wanted to pray with him would follow him. So that's always the principle with God. He's never going to come and get you. I mean, he'll come and call you. He'll speak to you. He'll woo you. He'll do all of those things. But at the end of the day, he'll never make you come to where he is. You have to choose to follow him. So Jesus' disciples came to him. Uh, in 11, 1, it says, Now it came to pass that when he was praying in a certain place, that when he had ceased, that one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples to pray. Now I want to remind you, a disciple is a person who, who remember, is seeking to put the Word of God in practice. They're not, they're not just somebody who wants some new information. They're not just a student. They're, they're somebody who's looking for a way of life. They want to learn how to to live the way their master lives. And if you're a disciple, that should be your goal. I want to live like Jesus lived. I want to treat people the way Jesus treated people. I want to have the courage that he had. I want to have the confidence that he had. You know, I want to be who I am in Jesus. In other words, my personality with all of his strengths. But let me just, let me just, let me just read you this. It says, uh, uh, th this is my Bible here, my phone. Most of, you, most of you use your phone for your Bible now, I'm sure. He says, and when you pray, you'll say, our Father... In heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins and trespasses for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, for centuries, the church has done nothing more than just recite that prayer. And remember, Jesus told the disciples, in, in the principles of the kingdom, Jesus told the disciples, He said, God's not going to hear you for your many words, for your vain repetitions. He said, when you pray, don't just pray a bunch of vain repetitions. You know, reciting a prayer. And, and you know, it's, it's kind of interesting. The number of people that you see that were in the Word of Faith movement, now they've gone back to a, a more ceremonial style of prayer. And of course, the only thing that I can think of is they never had a prayer life. They were never intimately connected with God. If they were, had been intimately connected Connected with God, they would not go back to formalism, ritualism, and ceremony to try to find some way to have some kind of a spiritual life. So, so we're not talking about reciting that prayer. We'll, we'll, it, it can't be used as a vain repetition. 
And we'll, we'll get into what it is in just a minute. But let's go back to this whole thing about, Lord, teach us to pray. You know, this is one of the things. When I first came out with a prayer organizer back in the very early 80s I th or mid 80s, um, man, I'm telling you what, people, uh, we would get 100 orders a day for prayer organizers. That was just beyond comprehension. And, uh, uh, and it, was, it was part of a, a prayer movement that was going on because that was back in the days when Dr. Paul Young E. Cho of, of South Korea, uh, who, who pastors the largest church in the world, came to America. I started teaching Americans how to, how to, how to pray from the perspective of being a disciple and, and to live from a perspective of fulfilling the Great Commission. And I'll tell you, Dr. Paul Young and Cho was a great influence in my life. I've been to Korea. I have met him personally and was, in fact, invited back in the 80s to be on the Church Growth International Board. I did not accept the invitation. I did not feel I was qualified. I did not feel like it was what God wanted me to do, but I considered it a great honor just to have the invitation extended to me. But I went to Prayer Mountain, and I'm telling you something. Our ministry, our church in those days, we, we did everything we could to seek God and to understand what prayer was, was really all about. And, you know, we had all kinds of prayer times and prayer meetings, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that until it becomes dead, legalistic, and ritualistic to the person that, that is participating. And once a person starts participating in something just because, uh, you know, we do it this way, just because I'm obligated to do it, and they don't engage their heart, it's going to really, really, really be frustrating. But here's what I found about prayer. The way I influenced the most people in the area of prayer was not by teaching about prayer. The way I influenced people in, in the area of prayer was showing them how to pray and getting them to pray with me. That is the key. That's what you want to do with your kids. You don't want to just tell your kids to pray. You want to pray with your kids. You don't want to just tell the new believer, the new person you want to Jesus, that they should pray. You want to pray with them. You want them to see you praying so that they understand what it is, what it's really like. So we're not talking about vainly reciting this, this prayer. In fact, the Lord's Prayer was taught by Jesus, who taught like a rabbi of his day. And most people say that the way the rabbis taught in those days is they would teach, uh, they would kind of give you an outline, and then they would come back and kind of fill out the blanks in that outline. So the Lord's Prayer is probably a breaking down of the different areas of life that we truly, truly need it to uh, address. And, um, and so I'm going to review all of these principles of prayer with you, and I'm going to emphasize them from the perspective of the finished work. But today we're talking about the fact that we've got to approach God as our Father. Now, this was novel to the, to the believers of Jesus' day. Um, you know, the word... Uh, father was used in, in the Bible, Old and New Testaments, about 225 or 220 something times. And what's interesting is around 200 of those were in the New Testament. And the word in the Old Testament that gets translated as father is more about the word master. And so they had a concept of approaching God as master, but they didn't really have a concept of approaching God. God is Father. When we come to pray, we've got to approach God as a son, not as a servant. The concept of father, not master, like I said, it was completely foreign to the Jews. It was completely foreign to the people uh, of that time. The word father is used in the New Testament was more like the word daddy. Now, I'll tell you something really interesting. I don't know if you have realized this in people from East India, but when they refer to their parents, they'll call their, their father Daddy G, or they might call someone that they respect by their first name, like they would call me uh, a Jim, Jim G. And, and I, for years I wondered, what is that G that they put on the end of that? What is that for? And I heard a preacher talking about this not long ago. I thought it was incredibly uh, wonderful, if you all know the truth. He said, you know, when you call your, your father daddy or when you call your mother mama or mommy, uh, that's incredibly personal. That's incredibly intimate. That's, that's, that's you know, that's, a, that, that's more about the, the, the family connection. But uh, they put the, word, the G on the end of that 
because that was more of a word of respect and reverence. And it was sort of like in the Indian culture, they were always trying to maintain this balance between we are completely at ease with God, but we never lose the sense of reverence and awe for Him. You know, you start talking to people today about, about the fear of God, and people just freak out because they think the fear of God is about being afraid God's going to hurt you. No, it's about having reverence for Him. You see, I want to know God as daddy from the sense that we are intimate. I'm approaching him as a son. But also, I want to remember that he is Jehovah. I want to remember who he is in his greatness and his splendor. And I want to approach him with the reverence and the honor that he's due. As a matter of fact, approaching him with reverence and honor has a lot to do with just moving yourself into this place uh, uh, of connecting from your heart. And this is, where you, this is where you'll do a lot of confessing the Word. And see, we're not confessing the Word to make it happen. We're not confessing the Word to get God to do something. But I'll tell you, when you get in that place of prayer and you've got that sense of flow and you start saying to God what He has said about Himself, and the idea is that you're, that you're not only saying it, but you're kind of visualizing it. You're kind of creating some kind of image, some kind of idea about it so that you connect to it as a reality that, that, that's positive, present tense, and personal. It's about you and, about you and him. And so uh, you know, this kind of brings us to a concept, I, and I don't have this research readily available, but years ago I did some research in the words praise and worship, and I found one of the r root words in praise and in worship goes back to a word that means to say back. And I started realizing one of the highest forms of praise and worship is when I take what God has said about me, about my life, about the promises, about Jesus, about himself. And when I say that back to him, acknowledging that I accept that as my truth, acknowledging that this is my reality, I want to tell you something, that is an incredible high level of praise and worship. You know, so much praise and worship that happens today. And, you know, I, I know I'm a little prejudiced. You know, I, man, I grew up, uh, at, you know, at the latter end of the, of the Jesus movement, and uh, boy, back in those days, we had prayer meetings that were just went on and worship services that went on and on and on and on and on. And people stayed connected. But one of the key factors in those things is we used the word of God to, to worship. We used the word. We sang the word of God back to God. And, and it would be these little short courses that wouldn't have many, many lines in them. But man, we'd sing them over and over and you're thinking about what they mean. You're thinking about what they mean to God. You're thinking about how you want God to feel about, uh, about when he's hearing this. And I'm telling you, uh, that's a higher level of praise and worship than the emotional responses that we have to a good band and to good singers. Listen, I, man, I love having a good band. I'm a musician, and I'll tell you, when, when I pull, pull my team up here on this stage, we're going to be tight. We're going to be right. It's going to be good. We're going to feel good. We're gonna, it's going to be good music. And as much as possible, we're going to get the best vocalist, the best musician, all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, all those people have also got to be worshipers themselves. They've got to be people who worship God for themselves. If they don't worship God for themselves, then they'll get up here and won't know what's going on. Because, see, we're not just trying... I mean, we do want to have an emotional influence on people. Don't get me wrong. But that's not the goal. We want to create emotions that are consistent with the promises that we're singing about and that we're talking about and that we're confessing, confessing and worshiping with. And so if I'm confessing scriptures about God giving me victory, man, I want, to, I, want to, I want to be feeling the victory. I want to be singing about the victory. I want to have emotions that feel like victory. And that's what, that's what happens in prayer. We connect with God on a level that's just beyond anything, uh, anything that's just a, a, a shallow emotional response. So, yeah, the music's good. I'm going to dance around and clap my hands and jump around. The question is, are you saying back to God, acknowledging to God what he says about himself? So we want to approach him as father. And, all, and, and first and foremost, reestablish that connection that he's the father, we're the son. I'll be back in just a minute. Make your plans now to be with me on July the 15th, 16th, and 17th for World Changer Weekend. And then again in October, you can uh, check on my website for a heart physics weekend. Listen, we're changing lives, changing the world, changing ourselves, growing in God. You know, almost 40 years ago, God gave me a plan for reaching the world in a way that nearly no one has ever done since the time of Jesus.
He said, instead of building a big conglomerate ministry, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but for me, he said, instead of doing this where you have a localized uh, power base, he said, invest in people who are influencers. And so we started Impact International School of Ministry, and we have, we have invested in influencers all over the world so that today millions and millions of people are hearing this message. People, we won't see this side of heaven. But you know something? We've taken that a step farther with what we call Operation One Billion, where all over the world we are starting Bible schools to train leaders. And in these third world countries, when they go to Bible school and when they get launched out, they go out and evangelize. They go out and start churches. It's not like America where people just go to Bible school and quit. Listen, I want to invite you to become uh, not just a world changer with our ministry, but join me in Operation One Billion. Welcome to my mentoring moment. As I tell you every single week, it doesn't matter what you hear. What matters is what you believe and then put into practice. And that's what the mentoring moment is for, is to move from the place of being a hearer of the Word of God to being a doer of the Word of God. And a doer of the Word of God is a poetic performer who emotionally applies the Word of God to their life. Listen, <clears throat> God is a heart God. That's one of the most important things you're ever going to need to connect with, which means that God communicates with you from his heart to your heart, not to your brain, not to your emotions, not to your, you know, not to your five senses. God's a heart. God always talks in the heart. And Jesus dwells in your heart by the Holy Spirit. And that is where our communion with God takes place. Nothing is real between us and God if it isn't real in our heart. It, that's, what make, that's the difference between a religious observance and a truly spiritual experience. So it's really interesting that in the Old Testament, you have three Hebrew words that all represent a various aspect of meditation. And every time you see the word pray, uh, worship, praise, prophesy, vision, and, and, and several others, you will see one of these three Hebrew words that have to do with meditation. In other words, prayer is only prayer. If it's, if it's happening from a reflective, meditative process. And, and, and you know, you're singing or you're worshiping based on what's going on in your heart. Uh, uh, you're, you're, you're talking out of your intellect or you're prophesying based on what's really going on in your heart. So, so I want you to understand something. The most common word that is used that has to do with meditation is a word that we twist up religiously. It's called, uh, it's called sanctification, to set something apart. And sanctification, that, that's all it is. We set ourselves apart geographically, you know, physically, but we set ourselves apart internally and give ourselves time with our Father. That's where I want to help you get to.